Hi, I'm Joan Mabinakis of the Southwest Spokane County Historical Society and director of the Cheney Historical Museum. This presentation is one of a series about women, and particularly club women, who were the activists and organizing force behind much of what created our community. Our story today is about our first two parks. I'm going to talk a lot about the Tillicum Club, and that's because our museum was started by the Tillicum Club women and operated by them until 2011. We have their records, so we know a lot about what they did. Now, they were not by any means the only women's club or organization in Cheney, let alone the surrounding countryside. The Women's Relief Corps, an auxiliary of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Royal Neighbors were women connected to the modern Woodman Fraternal Lodge, Eastern Star connected to the Mason's Lodge, Rebecca's of the Odd Fellows, the Women of Mooseheart, the Grandmother's Club, the Mother's Club, the PEO chapters, all were involved in civic actions to help our community. So when I say club women, I include many more than just the Tillicum Club. The block of land across D Street from the county courthouse and jail was owned by the Northern Pacific Railroad. The vacant block had a few trees, a lot of rocks, and debris from nearby home construction. In this etching from 1884, you can see a number of tree stumps. Horses were tethered there, and teams and wagons were left there while business was being done in the county offices. Now there are stories that a tree on this land was used in some early lynchings, but we have no direct evidence. And when I look at the trees standing behind the county jail, I wonder if one of those might have been a better candidate for expedient mob justice. In 1896, the Northern Pacific Railway Company deeded this block of land to the city of Cheney for the purposes of a city park. Let me introduce Alice Buchanan. She was a charter member of the Tillicum Club, and in 1924, she wrote a letter recalling the club's involvement in creating a useful park on that bit of land. She wrote, in October 1905, when some of us were pushing baby carts over rattling board sidewalks, members of the Tillicum Club learned of the block of land that the railroad had given the city for a park. It was from this that they decided that this was a project worth pursuing, and they drafted a petition. I love what Alice wrote here. Very timid club women appeared before the mayor and city council with a humble petition that the Tillicum Club might be responsible in interesting the cooperation of the community for creating a city park on that land. And although we were given little encouragement, we were allowed to go ahead. The task looked hopeless. The block of land had a number of native pine trees, but it was most unsightly, with boulders, broken tree branches, rubbish, and very poor soil. The Tillicum Club women engaged with the Men's Commercial Club, which was a forerunner of today's Chamber of Commerce. And in March of 1906, the two launched a project to create City Park for Cheney. The women pressed forward with a publicity and fundraising campaign. They held dinners, special events, sought out volunteers, and engaged the community spirit to get the project going. The commercial club organized the labor force and teams to clear away the rubbish, branches, and rocks. And here when I'm talking about teams, I'm not talking about teams of people, but teams of horses and wagons, which they also used to haul in the good soil to cover up the hard pan. Now the women were also in charge of making sure that the laborers had plenty of refreshments for all their hard work. The Cheney Public School was right across the street from the park where the old county courthouse had been, and the teachers and school children did their bit, as Alice said, by raking up rubbish and serving hot coffee and lunches to those who were doing the teamwork. 
the rehabilitation of the land took several years fundraising continued such as an event that was held in may of 1909 the spokesman review wrote the civic improvement clubs of cheney have arranged a tag day proceeds to be used for the improvement of city park those who buy tags will be admitted to a ball game between the businessmen and faculty men of the normal school they later reported that the event netted $35 and that it was the commercial club and Tillicum clubs who have planted the lawns and shrubs at the park. In October that same year, the two organizations held a cafeteria supper for the benefit of the park, and it made the park fund richer by $50. Alice Buchanan wrote that in the spring of 1910, when the park looked very inviting and usable, Mrs. R. G. Nelly Andres, a club member, had the inspirational idea of having a community celebration in the form of an old English May Day. Now her suggestions were carried out, and a lovely May Queen with golden red hair was chosen. She wore a simple white dress trimmed with real garlands, and she was carried in a green-bowered litter by six stalwart young men. The Queen's litter was followed by Robin Hood's band and other fantastic cos costumed groups. Now, there were no automobiles in that first May Day, but this was the beginning of the annual May Day Festival in Chini. Alice continued in her 1924 letter that that first May Day was a decided success, so much so that it has become a unique part of our community life. Each organization in the city contributes, either in the parade or expense, and the festival now draws hundreds of visitors from the surrounding towns. Now, as a side note, the Tillicum Club managed the festival with support of all the other organizations in town and the normal school until 1935. By then, it was drawing in thousands of visitors, and it was taken over by the Men's Commercial Club until it was interrupted by the Second World War. The festival came back for about 10 years after the war. These are Tillicum Club women dressed in costume for that very first May Day. And here I'm trying to draw your attention to the ground where we can see that there's still a lot of scrub grass and weeds in the park. Now we may cringe at the women's costumes from our 21st century perspective. In their time, they viewed Indians as noble, romantic, and honorable people of the past. They had chosen an Indian word of friendship as the name of their club. Though their vision of the contemporary Native Americans in their community was much more ambivalent. The Tillicum Club women oversaw the planting and care of the plants at the park, as well as care and maintenance of the restroom that was there. They solicited their husbands to help with the planting of trees and shrubs, and their children helped with weeding, planting flowers and bulbs, and watering the lawn and flowers with watering cans from the hand pump in the park. In those early days, the club received $12.50 a month for nine months of the year from the city of Cheney. In 1913, they listed expenses as $2 for a rose bush plus 35 cents for the delivery of the bush. Then there was $10.50 for cleaning of the restroom, cleaning of the chimney of the restroom, along with towels and toilet paper. In 1922, the women convinced the city to add a drinking fountain to the park. Now here we're looking across 4th Street to the 1913 Cheney High School. And I don't know if you can see back behind the May Day dancers, they have brought a piano in on skids to play the music. In the late 1920s, the community Christmas tree, a live fir tree, was decorated and lit in City Park, and the community members came and sang carols while Mrs. Reggie Hodge played on a tiny portable organ. Now the park isn't large enough for sports, 
but it was a great place, being across the street from the Cheney High School, for school photos of sports teams. And this is the 1936 football team. In the late 1930s, the Tillicum Club sponsored the Campfire Girls to clean up the flower beds and plant trees. The Tillicum Club planted a number of memorial trees in the park, as well as on the college grounds. Those trees honored various club women, teachers, and prominent citizens. Originally, there were plaques with each tree, but time and weather and other things have caused the plaques to disappear. The city of Cheney hired a maintenance man in 1940, and the Tillicum Club relinquished their care of the park. In 1945, as seen here, the Campfire Girls planted a blue spruce as a memorial to their organization. That same year, the Grandmother's Club planted a tree in memory of the soldiers who lost their lives in World War II. In the late 1930s, the women's clubs of the community raised funds to provide equipment for the community playground at City Park. And in 1943, the Tillicum Club sponsored the building of four picnic tables for the park to be placed near that playground. Now there's still a community playground in the park, but back in those days, we had the kind of playground equipment you could kill yourself with. Private individuals proposed to the city council in 1967 the redevelopment of that property to hold a new medical facility. This spurred the Tillicum women to action. They rediscovered the 1896 deed from the Northern Pacific Railroad to the city of Cheney, deed number 4321, Spokane County, City of Cheney, 8 February 1896, Block 7, City of Cheney, mutually agreed to and accepted by parties hereto that the City of Cheney shall retain and use said block of land for the purposes of a city park. The women also rediscovered their own involvement in the development in the park. They spearheaded a publicity campaign to urge the community to write letters to their council members to keep the property as the Northern Pacific Railroad intended, and also let the council members know how much the park enriches the community. The medical facility instead was located on North 7th Street. Another women's organization is behind the Granite War Memorial Monument in the park. The Women's Relief Corps, George Wright Post No. 8, was organized and chartered on the 15th of July, 1893. It was started by the wives of the Civil War veterans as an auxiliary to the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR. Mrs. Marcella Ellison Cook was the Post's first president. Here are the members of the GAR and the Women's Relief Corps in front of their hall on First Street. The image dates from about 1890. And here we have Mrs. Marcella Cook. She's the only woman in the picture that we've been able to identify. The Women's Relief Corps embarked on a project of putting a monument in the park to honor the Civil War soldiers and in April 1915, the Normal School donated some of the granite stones from their 1896 school building to use in the monument. Now the WRC and the GAR raised funds from the public to have those stones placed in the park as the base for their future monument. The square base stands about five feet high. The Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR, was a restricted organization. It was only open to those men who had served in the Union Army or Navy during the Civil War. That meant it had an expiration date. By contrast, the Women's Relief Corps allowed membership to any woman who was interested in doing the work. And that meant by the time you get into the 19 teens, the Women's Relief Corps members outnumbered the men by quite a few. Now the women held monthly meetings 
dinners and other social entertainments to help bring the old men out for some social interactions. Now officially, the GAR only allowed the union members to come in, but unofficially the veterans of the Confederacy were welcome to spend time reliving the old battles by the stove. In 1917, the two organizations set up a trust agreement by which the property on First Street was given to the Women's Relief Corps in order that when the GAR post ceased to exist, a monument would be erected in memory of the Grand Army of the Republic to those men of the Civil War who saved our Union. The women began fundraising in earnest in 1923, holding dinners, entertainments, and socials, and in September of 1924, as they were ready to put out their contract for the stone monument, they appealed again to the community for funds. Mrs. Propsy Walter wrote, Our comrades of the Civil War are growing very feeble, and it is our desire to complete this undertaking while our dear old boys, several of whom made the historical march with Sherman to the sea, are yet able to assist in the ceremonies of unveiling the monument. Right now is the time, as this committee plans to get into action very soon, and the more cash we have behind us, the better terms we can make. Donations can be left with William Walter at his place of business. Their campaign brought in nearly $400, more than two-thirds of the final amount that they needed, when in September of 1924, they ordered the monument through the Spokane Monumental Works. They had the stone quarried from Medical Lake to match the stones of the base. The women commenced working with the normal school for a joint Armistice Day event. The annual services to be held at the normal school, followed by a procession to the park for the unveiling exercises. Participating would be the Spokane Post of the American Legion and the Spanish-American War Veterans, the Women's Relief Corps members, and the local Women's Relief Corps and GAR and the American Legion. The Cheney Free Press wrote, on November 11, 1924, a layer of snow decorated the trees and the shrubs in the park. Several hundred persons attended the service in the city park Armistice Day when the monument erected by the local Women's Relief Corps was unveiled. The monument of chipped granite from the quarries at Medical Lake rises 11 feet above the granite base on which it stands. The ceremony included a patriotic song, a prayer by the Reverend H.J. Wood of the Methodist Church, an address, and J.W. Hodge playing taps while the audience stood silently with their heads bared. Mrs. Laura Tyler and Mrs. Love Davis unveiled the monument, and wreaths were placed at the base. Mrs. Tyler gave a short address on the Corps' efforts, which brought the audience to tears as she eulogized the soldiers, living and dead, who fought for the United States, ending with, Long after we who have erected it have passed on, this monument will stand here, a silent reminder, not only of the sacrifices they have made for us, but of the trust and patriotic duty that is ours. Then the crowd joined in singing the song America. One side of the monument was dedicated to the soldiers of the Grand Army of the Republic, another to the Spanish-American War veterans, and a third to the soldiers of the World War. Didn't have a number yet. On the fourth side, was the name of the local GWRC chapter and a brief tribute to the soldiers who fought under the American flag. On Memorial Day in 1964, members of the Women's Relief Corps General George Wright Post No. 8 placed wreaths on the monument. This is a rather poor newspaper image, but from left is Mrs. Alma Flicky. Mrs. Pete Bilsbach, Mrs. Eva Potts, and Mrs. Mary Maddox. 
If anyone knows Mrs. Billsbach's first name, please leave it in the comments below. I would love to reunite her with it. The Women's Relief Corps continued into the 1980s in Cheney, and then the post was transferred to Spokane. As young men and women have joined their ancestors in defending the United States, new conflicts and names have been added to the monument. On June 14, 2007, City Park was renamed Veterans Memorial Park in a ceremony with the Boy Scouts. Today, the American Legion and VFW are in charge of adding names and caring for the memorial. The land that became Sutton Park had unofficially been used as a park for a number of years before it became the property of the city. In 1939, the Kiwanis Club sponsored bringing in a water pipe to the park for a faucet and a drinking fountain, as well as building a stone fireplace for the public to use while cooking. In a ceremony on the 5th of May, 1945, the mayor of Cheney, Louis Van Patten, accepted the gift from Mrs. Elsie Maxim Sutton in memory of her late husband, Senator William J. Sutton. This created the city's second official park. Women's Club's members donated funds to plant the trees that line the 6th Street side of Sutton Park, and the Tillicum Club continued to sponsor the planting of trees in the park well into the 1990s. In the 1950s and 60s, the annual Easter egg hunt was held at Sutton Park. And in 1955, the Tillicum Club donated $180 to install lighting at the park. The Women of the Royal Neighbors America Camp Hope donated a sign in 1963 commemorating Mrs. Sutton's gift from 1945. From left, we have Mrs. Lulu Cutting, Mrs. Betty Hale, and Mrs. Tom Ryan. Again, if anyone knows Mrs. Ryan's first name, please leave it in the comments below. Annabelle Heidecker was appointed as chairman of the committee to look into the possibility of a shelter at Sutton Park as a community service project in 1967. By May, the fundraising was underway, and in June, the club reported that the Lions Club was ready to pour the concrete slab for the base of the shelter. The Tillicum Club took the lead in raising the funds for the materials of, of building the shelter, and the men of the Lions Club used their volunteer labor to erect the 18 by 12 foot structure. The city installed the electricity there. Pete Heidecker, Pete the painter, donated the paint and painted the structure. Lois Moose contributed $68 toward the concrete and made the lunches for the Lions Club while they worked on building the shelter. The Tillicum Club also used funds from their memorial fund honoring Ethel Frazier, Ethel Small, Elsie Sutton, Grace Ben Patton, and Edith Davis. Alvin Miller made the sign for the shelter that said, Gift of the Tillicum Club, 1967. Today the shelter is still being used, and if you notice where the drinking fountain is and the park bench, that's where the 1939 rock chimney once stood. And now a quick mention of sidewalks and street trees. Early notes from the Telecom Club talk about writing letters to the city council and meeting with the early mayors about the maintenance of the wooden sidewalks, as well as creating safe and clean crosswalks and cleaning of the streets. A story about those sidewalks from Ruth Louise Ratcliffe, who was born in 1895. We had wooden sidewalks all over town, and in order for them to expand in the rain and in the hot weather, there were large cracks between the boards. And many a time people would be walking along with their money in their hands, 
or it would fall out of their pockets and drop down through those cracks. There were always quite a few coins to be found under the sidewalk. That made a lovely pastime, for the boys mostly. Sometimes the girl would spy the money, and then the boys would go in to retrieve it. I don't remember exactly how they got it out. Maybe they took a hook or used a stick to bring it to the edge so that they could dig it out. Anyway, it was quite a pastime in those old days when we were children. This photo was taken sometime around 1910 when there was an effort underway by the businessmen downtown to replace the wooden sidewalks with modern, smooth and safe cement ones. Women had advocated for raised crosswalks, which would allow them to stay clean while crossing the muddy dirt streets, especially in the business district and the route from the train depot up to the normal school. Some businesses even advertised about the sidewalks along the entire block of their business for the convenience of the ladies. Women also pushed for the planting of trees along the streets, both for beautifying the town, but probably more importantly for cooling the hot summer streets, businesses, and houses. They wrote letters to the newspaper encouraging the community members and the city to make an effort to plant trees throughout the city for shade. In the 1930s, County Commissioner Sam Webb worked with the Washington State College, now WSU, to bring in and plant black locust trees along the streets in Cheney. Those trees were recommended by the college as fast-growing shade trees without having invasive roots. They stood up well to our cold summers, our cold winters, excuse me, and our hot summers, and a few of those trees still can be found throughout the city. The Tillicum Club and other women's club also had trees planted on the college campus and through many of our parks. Here's an example of one that was planted in 1949 near Senior Hall. It still stands today on the college campus. I want to thank you for joining me today for this story. And if you have any ideas for things you'd like to see in future videos, you can write to me at the director, chinemuseum.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on Pinterest.